everyone. Happy Monday to all of you. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are watching me. Thank you for joining me for this week's teaching. I am Krista Bontrager. I am a Christian theologian and public apologist, and this is the channel where I offer teaching about the Bible and theological commentary on social issues. 16 days ago, Hamas fighters left Gaza and invaded Israel. They captured and tortured civilians, including the elderly, raping women and killing babies. Israeli citizens fled to bomb shelters and the IDF is now engaged in a full war against Hamas. The human tragedy of war is being broadcast on social media, and quite frankly, I'm finding it overwhelming. I'm not sure that we were designed by God to be able to take in or process as many violent images and information as we have to in the social media age. I'm deeply saddened by the tragic loss of innocent lives both in Israel and in Gaza. The terrorist actions of Hamas and the IDF's response only leaves grieving families behind. Iran-backed Hamas is promoting terror and violence, and it is an outrage to our humanity and should be unequivocally condemned. There is a lot of confusing information out there in our own family. I know that my husband, my daughter, Emily, and myself have all been struggling to share with each other reliable content, but we are trying to persist. There is so much propaganda out there that's designed to evoke strong emotions, to villainize one side or the other. It is honestly difficult. For those of us who are regular people to tell who is telling the truth. So I want to encourage you to take time to pray, to reflect, to research before jumping behind the keyboard. I think my hot take, your hot take, is probably not as important or as insightful as we may think, and definitely not as, as important as prayer. And I say this to myself as well. I've been slow to speak about these issues, largely because I wanted to give my emotions time to calm down. I wanted to research a lot of things, take time to do that, get some biblically informed thoughts together. And quite frankly, I am hesitant to comment on issues that require so much research because they are compl complicated and have a rough history. I do think at this point, I can offer a few basic biblical principles to help anchor Christians on a few critical issues as we journey through these choppy waters together. And I will continue to release more content in the coming weeks as I attempt to cover the events happening in the Middle East from a variety of angles. For starters, if you haven't already done so, I want to encourage you to listen to the conversation that Monique and I did a couple of weeks ago with our friend Kevin Briggins. I've mirrored that discussion on my Theology Mom podcast. And we during that uh, conversation, we did some looking into the history behind the conflict. And personally, I learned a lot and found it quite helpful. You might too. Today, I'm going to be addressing three critical questions that I've seen people asking on social media with regard to the Jews, Judaism, and the state of Israel. I hope I can bring some clarity to the confusion that I'm seeing on these particular biblical issues. Let's get into this. Let me make it very clear at the outset what I am not going to do today. <laughs> I am not going to attempt to talk about prophecies at the end of Ezekiel and try to tie them into the current news cycle. I don't read the book of Revelation like it's the newspaper. 
Uh, you can go check out my previous conversations about the end of the world. Maybe if Elaine is still there, she's one of my moderators. She can put a link to part one in the chat for everyone uh, to my teaching series on the end of the world. I also did an entire class on the book of Revelation. But that is not really how I roll. I'm not into reading the book of Revelation like it's the newspaper. What I am going to do is to do my very best, not to say it'll be perfect, but I'm going to do my best as I can, as I, as I think about things in this moment, to share three critical points with you today that I think that Christians should be conversant about and understand. So let's begin with number one. Um, hopefully my husband has a slide that I prepared earlier. Hopefully he got that link. So we're going to begin with number one, all true Christians ought to have a special place in their heart for the Jewish people and pray that their eyes will be opened to Jesus as the Messiah. Now, when I use the phrase Jewish people, it is important to differentiate between Jewish people and individuals from the geopolitical political state of Israel as a nation. I'm speaking into this point about people with Jewish heritage, um, Jewish ethnicity, Jewish religion, no matter where they may live, okay? So a little background to set some context here that I, I think it will be helpful to understand as we consider this point of why I think Christians should have a heart for Jewish people and how to pray for them. Now, the major storyline of the Bible, of, particularly in the Old Testament, is the story of how God elects and preserves a people, namely the Jews, through which the Messiah would come and be born. Jesus, we would say as Christians, is that Messiah. And Jesus was a Jew. He was born to Jewish parents in Bethlehem. They lived in Nazareth. And in fact, the very first verse of the entire New Testament says this in Matthew chapter one. It says, this is the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. And Christ is a way of talking about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus was a Jew. He was not a Catholic. He was not a Baptist. He was not a, a Presbyterian. Jesus was a Jew. He was ethnically a Jew. He was religiously a Jew. His ancestry included David and Abraham. But Jesus, we would say as Christians, is also even greater than David and Abraham. He was the fulfillment that they anticipated. He was the long-awaited Messiah. But the great message of the New Testament is that the Messiah is not just for the Jews. He came to us through the Jews. But God's purpose, is it the, the great mystery of the New Testament, is that God made a way so that all people from all nations could receive an invitation to come be a part of God's covenant people. Although Jews were God's chosen people through whom the Messiah would come, the apostle Paul, who was a rabbi under Gamaliel, he lays out his case in the first three chapters of Romans that Jews and Gentiles alike are sinners. So whether you were a Jew or whether you were a Gentile, there is one and only one way to be restored to the Creator's good graces, and that is by believing that Jesus is the Messiah. God's kingdom has come near. Jesus is the one who was sent into the world to make a way for salvation. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 3. He says, what, then, if, in other words, if everybody's a sinner, if Jews and Gentiles alike are sinners, then Paul says, then what advantage has the Jew? 
Well, what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God, the sayings of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Even though, Paul says, even though not all Jews came to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, it doesn't nullify God's plans for the Jews. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Jesus' words recorded in the Gospel of John make the startling claim that he is the way to the Father. It says that he's the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus calls himself the door, the bread of life, the resurrection, and the life. He is the bread, the manna in the wilderness, and anyone who wants life must come through Jesus. Whether you're a Jew or a Gentile, the door to the Father is through Jesus. There is not one plan of salvation for Gentiles and another one for Jews. There is no other name under heaven by which humans can be saved. And that name is Jesus. Now, one of the major questions faced by the early Christians was the question of whether Gentiles could be considered full covenant members without first becoming Jews. This is the big issue in many of the epistles and in the book of Acts. And we read, in fact, in Acts chapter 10 and chapter 15, how the Holy Spirit came to dwell in Gentile Christians just as he did in Jewish Christians. Peter said it this way in Acts chapter 10. So Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And this saying comes right after the Holy Spirit comes over Cornelius and his household. And Cornelius was a, an, a, a soldier in the Roman army. In Romans chapters 3 to 6, Paul explains how Jews and Gentiles alike are offered new life by believing in Jesus as the Messiah. All those who believe in Jesus as Messiah, whether Jew or Gentile, are what now make up what, what we call the, ch the church. The true church consists of those true believers in Jesus as the Messiah. We're called brothers and sisters to one another. And one of the outcomes of the Messiah's mission is that through his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension, the cultural enemies now can become family. Once we come into Christ, once we believe in Jesus as the Messiah, our primary identity is that of being a Christian, to be a Christian is to follow Christ or to follow the Messiah. It, our primary identity is no longer in our nationality or our ethnicity, but rather it is that we belong to a new spiritual family. The Apostle Paul applies several analogies used to, to describe Israel in the Old Testament, and he uses those analogies and applies them to the church. For example, he says, all who believe in Christ are children of Abraham, and that the church is now the temple of God. This doesn't mean, however, that God has no plan for the Jews or no love for the Jewish people. Just as there is one Savior, one gospel, one way to the Father, and that's all through Jesus, we want to remember that that is a plan and, and an invitation that is extended to the Jews too. And they have a special um, they have a special place because they have the oracles of God. There are certain advantages. That's what the word I'm looking for. The Jews have 
that we Gentiles do not have. Here's a great summary of the purpose of Jesus's mission from Romans chapter three. I'm going to start in verse 22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And I want you to remember the, that the word Christ is in is uh, kind of the Greek way of, of expressing the Messiah. Faith in Jesus, the Messiah, for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Messiah Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because of his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at this present time that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In the media context, what he's saying there is that all meaning all Jews and Gentiles, all people, all nations, all ethnicities, and that there is only one way to come into the Father's good graces, to have that covenant relationship restored, and that is through grace as a gift because of the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Forgiveness is how we have peace with God. In a sense, placing your faith, hope, and confidence in Jesus as the Messiah is just about the most Jewish thing that you can do because Jesus himself was a Jew. This is why the Apostle Paul, the one who studied as a rabbi under Gamaliel, preaches the gospel first to the Jews. Whenever he visits a new city in the book of Acts, he goes to the synagogue first. This is why he says in Romans chapter 9 that he would rather be under a curse if it would bring his fellow Jews into a knowledge of Jesus as the Messiah. He says, I am speaking truth in the Messiah. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. Paul is describing how he feels about his fellow Jews. For I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Messiah for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh, those who share his ethnicity, those who share his common, common faith and common history and common ancestry. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Messiah, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. In spite of the struggle of some Jews to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, Paul persisted in his love for the Jewish people and longed to see their eyes opened to the reality of who Jesus is. Paul loved them, and he prayed for them. And as Paul reflects on the mystery of election in these verses, he, he sets a powerful warning to us as Gentiles that we might not fall into the sins of pride and presumption. Paul warns the Gentiles that, that we have been grafted into a tree of Israel. We must never feel superior to the Jews, even if some of the unbelieving branches have been pruned. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 11, where Paul goes into this a little bit. And um, it's just a couple of pages after the verses we read in chapter nine. Paul says this, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself it is, am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars, and I am left alone, and, and they seek my life. But what was God's reply to him? 
I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to, to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? I am speaking to you Gentiles, and as much then as I am speaking as an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean? but life from the dead. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy as the whole lump, and if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, in other words, some of the Jews didn't believe, and you Gentiles, although a wild shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree. In other words, so now those promises, those prophecies are part of our inheritance as we have been grafted into the root of the Jews and God's plan of salvation to bring the Messiah through them. Do not be arrogant, it says in verse 18, toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root supports you. Then you will say branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief. But you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note the kindness and severity of God. Severity toward those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. In other words, you know, watch your step. Watch what you're doing. Be careful. Don't get arrogant. Don't get prideful. Don't start believing in yourself. And even if they did not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in for God has the power to graft them in again. Or if you were cut off what is by nature an olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? This really is Romans 11 is the extended conversation of, of, of the, our understanding of God's plan for the Jews. He has not forsaken his people. He still has a plan. Paul hints here that God in God's providence, there's this time of hardening of the Jews' hearts, but that it will not go on forever. Their unbelief will eventually turn to belief at some future point. When the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, all Israel will be saved. Now, I don't know what all of this means. In, in verses 26 and 27, Paul quotes Isaiah 59, which speaks of a deliverer coming from Zion who will banish ungodliness from Jacob. He seems to be anticipating some kind of a future uh, fulfillment of the Old Testament promises to, to the Jews in addition to the resurrection and of the Messiah in the first coming. And I'm going to be honest, I, I am not 100% sure of all the details of what Paul means when he says that Israel will eventually come to faith. And again, I think he means Israel here as he means the Jews, not necessarily the modern day state of Israel. At minimum, I think he is meaning out some kind of large scale in gathering 
of of repentance and and um renewal where Jews will have their eyes opened and see Jesus as the Messiah come into the new covenant before Jesus' second coming. But could it also include more than that? I think it could possibly include the literal earthly reign of Jesus from Jerusalem. I'm open to that. Um, This could be what is hinted at in the thousand year reign in Revelation chapter 20, as well as some of the prophecies of the Old Testament. Personally, I don't have a strong conviction on those matters of all of those details and how that's going to work out. But at minimum, I think that God still has a plan for the Jews. I do think that there's going to be a large scale revival of the Jews toward the end. And I think that we need to reject any sort of teaching that says that God has set aside the Jews forever. I think if you think that, you might be in for a shock later. Christians should have respect for the Jews as God's special people through whom God brought salvation to the world in the person of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and to hate the relatives of our Savior even those who don't believe it ought to be a, an unthinkable position as a Christian. Even if particular Jews hate us, even if they spit on us, we are called by Christ to respond with kindness, long suffering, prayer, and servanthood, and above all, to preach the good news that the Messiah Jesus has come. And even if something happens to our Jewish neighbors, even if their houses were to be bombed by Hamas, and even if they hate us as Christians, our first duty as Christians is to pray for both of them and and to, to pray that they would find faith in Jesus as Messiah and to aid them and serve them whenever we can. Okay, so that's my first point. Okay, so let's review really quick here. My first point was that all true Christians ought to have a special place in our hearts for the Jewish people and pray that their eyes will be open to Jesus as the Messiah. Now let's turn to my second point, and that is that the Judaism of the Bible, in other words, the Judaism prior to 70 AD, has limited overlap with modern-day rabbinic Judaism. Now, there's a fair amount of confusion among both Jews and Christians about this point. Let me see if I can be of some help here. The Judaism of the Bible is laid out largely in the books of Genesis through Deuteronomy. This is where we learn about Abraham and Moses and the temple system and all of that. Sometimes I call this on my streams, I call this the Mosaic Law. I I believe our Jewish friends call it the Tanakh. And this is where the conditions are laid out for the special covenant relationship that they have, that the descendants of Jacob have with God. For ancient Jewish people, life focused around the temple, the sacrifices, the priesthood, and the feasts. But by the time we get to the New Testament, we see that some factions have developed within Judaism. After a few hundred years of exile and return and occupation and conquering by the Greeks and the Romans. There's just a lot of questions that were being raised in the Jews' minds of how do we survive? There were different strategies that emerged for that survival. The Pharisees had one kind of strategy, and that was to solidify theology. The zealots had another kind of strategy, and that was drive out the Romans by force. Meanwhile, the regular people were just sort of struggling to pay their taxes to the Romans and maintain some kind of normalcy so they could raise their families. Let's say that um, 
as most scholars agree, that Jesus' resurrection and, and ascension was somewhere around 33 AD. By 70 AD, Jerusalem is destroyed by the Romans. There were a number of, of rebellions, some of them related to the zealots, and the Romans had finally had enough, and they came in and flattened Jerusalem in 70 AD. They left no stone untor unturned, um, not even on the temple. Now, this event of 70 AD was a critical turning point in Judaism, because without a temple, there could be no Mosaic Judaism. There could be no Judaism that we read about in Exodus and Leviticus, okay? Because there could be no proper sacrifices, after the destruction of the temple, Jewish scholars regrouped to try to work out how to reconfigure their faith without the temple, the priesthood, or the sacrifices. And these efforts are what evolved into what I would call is modern-day rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism is the foundation for the type of Judaism that we see today. Now, Jews do still celebrate the Mosaic festivals that we read about in the Bible. They read the scripture, they pray. But the sacrificial system, the core of how they would access the presence of God and receive forgiveness of their sins has been replaced largely by a system of doing good deeds and adherence to the interpretations of the rabbis. This is called the Talmud. And this leads me to my main point here, is that the Judaism of today, even Orthodox Judaism, is not the same, exactly the same, as the Judaism of the Bible. It contains remnants of those those mosaic Jewish beliefs from the Bible, but it is a lot of it is something else. It is what I call rabbinic Judaism. So then this leads us right into an important question to consider, and that is, should Christians participate in efforts to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem? My answer to that question is no. Let me explain why. I do not believe that Christians should participate in efforts to rebuild the third temple in Jerusalem. Now, I know there's a museum there. You can go see the artifacts that they've reconstructed to get ready to build the third temple. I'm aware that there are efforts to rebuild the third temple, but I personally do not think that Christians should be monetarily supporting these efforts we should not be pushing for these efforts. And let me explain why. In 1 Kings chapter 8, it says that the Lord came to dwell in the temple. This is during the time of Solomon. There was nothing in the ark, it says in 1 Kings chapter 8, except the two tablets of stone that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So I could have gone all the way back to Exodus. I did. There's similar passages in Exodus about how God's presence was with the people in the tabernacle God's presence then comes to dwell in the temple. I used to teach my children when they were small. And if you want to know God's address on earth uh, during the old covenant times, it was there in the temple. That's where his presence was. That's where he chose to dwell. Unfortunately, after Solomon, uh, there was a long period of prolonged rebellion, some renewals in the South, some times of revival and repentance. But after a few hundred years of prolonged rebellion, God had finally had enough 
and he sent his people into captivity. Okay. In Ezekiel chapter 10, we read how the presence of God leaves the temple. When the people come back to the land, we read in the book of Ezra how they made an effort to rebuild the temple. But there is a passage where the older generation says, you know, that it was that they remembered Solomon's temple and it wasn't as glorious. But what we don't see in the book of Ezra, and I find this omission interesting, is that there is no explicit description that God sent his presence back to live in that temple. Now, maybe he did, and maybe the text just doesn't mention it. But I do find it interesting that it's specifically mentioned in Exodus and in Kings, but not in Ezra. But when we turn to the Gospel of John, we see this verse in chapter 1 of John. We see that Jesus, John describes Jesus by saying, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. The word dwelt among us there is a hint to pitched his tent or tabernacled among us. And then we see that this is his, the glory, the glory came again. The presence of God came again to earth in Jesus. He was like a living, breathing, walking tabernacle, bringing the presence of God to the people wherever he went. This is part of what I think when Jesus says that the kingdom of God has come near. When we look in Revelation chapter 21, we see that the eternal presence of God will be with us in the new Jerusalem for all eternity. It says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be their God. So here we have the restoration of kind of this eternal temple that never again will God and humans be separated from one another's presence, but rather it, there is a permanency there and we will have face-to-face -face fellowship with God in the new Jerusalem. So how do I tie this into the question of whether or not Christians should participate in rebuilding the third temple. This is the tricky part. <laughs> there are voices out there in Christianity who will say things like Christians should help the Jews rebuild the temple. And I am of the strong opinion that they should not. Um, I, I don't think that these efforts have a biblical foundation. God has one temple on the earth, and that is the new covenant people of God. And one day he will have one temple that is eternal in heaven. Whosoever believes in Jesus as the Messiah is part of the new covenant people of God and is part of the, the temple of God. To rebuild a physical temple, to reinstate the sacrifices, to reinstate the priesthood would be an abomination and a rejection of the cross. We still need a temple. We still need a priest. We still need a sacrifice. We must still enter into the presence of God, but we must worship the correct God correctly. And we must have the correct priest, the correct sacrifice, and going into his presence through particular blood. And we see this laid out in Hebrews chapter 9. In Hebrews chapter 9, it talks about Jesus being the great high priest and that this, the, the physical temple 
The curtain was torn in two at the cross of Jesus. I think, I'm not going to take the time to read Hebrews 9 right now, but you can read that on your own. It's it's a great summary of what I'm talking about here. But in my opinion, God used the Romans in his providential will to destroy the second temple so that the worship could not keep going on forever. Rather, God in his providence has said, no, there is only one way to get into my presence, and that is through the sacrifice and the priesthood of my son, Jesus. And so the temple was demolished. It was removed, the physical temple. And there is now the temple on earth is you and I, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. So no, I do not believe that Christians should be involved with efforts to rebuild the physical temple. To try to reinstate the sacrificial system, in my opinion, would be an abomination. It would be to desecrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But... Going back to my big overarching point here is that the Judaism of the Bible has limited overlap with modern day rabbinic Judaism. I know that there are many efforts in rabbinic Judaism to restore the temple and restore the sacrifices, but I think that all of that has everything that that the Mosaic law pointed to has been fulfilled in Jesus. Okay, let's move on to my final point. I got 15 minutes left. I'll see if I can make it here. So my final point, my third and final point is this. Real Christians should have nothing to do with hating Jewish people or hating Palestinians or hating any other ethnic group. Now, I'm going to be very direct here. I haven't been direct already. I'm going to be really direct now. German Nazism was a neo-pagan demonic cult that tried to pass itself off as what I call a funhouse demonic mirror version of our faith. I know that Hitler tried to say he's a Christian, he was not, and every Jewish person who has thought that Hitler was a Christian, I just want you to know today that real Christians want you to know that that is a demonic funhouse mirror version of our faith. Hitler tried to hijack our faith and fly under the banner of that with Jewish hate, and we have nothing to do with that. Hitler's irrational and demonically fueled hatred of Jewish people wasn't the first, and it won't be the last. We could see it all the way back in the book of Esther. We can see it all the way back in the book of Exodus with Pharaoh killing the Jewish boys. We can see it with Haman trying to wipe out the Jews. We can see it with Herod trying to wipe out the Jewish baby boys. And if Christians were to take a hard and sober-minded look even at our own history, we would see many incidents of hatred towards the Jewish people. My concern is that I am seeing an increasing and alarming amount of posts as people are being emboldened, citing passages and again, trying to hijack our faith by saying it is okay for Christians to hate Jewish people, to pronounce curses over Jewish people. Here are the passages you might see on social media trying to give biblical warrant for Jew hatred. The first one, hopefully Bob's got it here, is in John chapter 8. Jesus says, you are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, or he's a liar and father of lies. Bob, if you can scroll down, I'm going to read a couple other passages. This is from Matthew 27, right before Jesus goes to the cross. So when Pilate saw that 
he was gaining nothing, but rather than a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And the people answered his blood be on us and our children. And they released, and he released for them Barabbas and having scourged Jesus delivered him to be crucified. One more verse. This is from Acts chapter 2, from Peter's sermon on Pentecost. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. These passages... I see on social media being used over and over again as being a biblical warrant for hating Jews. The logic often goes something like this. Jesus called ethnic Jews who rejected him children of the devil. So we can too. Frankly, I find this kind of thinking disturbing, not to mention profoundly unbiblical and demonic. I also find it interesting that the Venn diagram of people who talk like this are also often the same people who condemn forms of multi-generational guilt due to slavery. In fact, it's not really a Venn diagram. It's more like one big circle. You cannot have it both ways. Either people are guilty of their sin, the sins of their forefathers through their collective guilt, or they aren't. According to scripture, every person will stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day to give an account for their sins. And to my knowledge, there is no such thing as generational guilt in that way that we will be held accountable before the throne of Christ. It says this in the book of Ezekiel. Bob's going to put the verses up here for us. Ezekiel chapter 18. This is an important passage. It says, yet you say, why should not the son, the son suffer for the iniquity of the father when the son has, has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statutes? He shall surely live. The soul of whose sins shall die. The son shall not suffer the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer the iniquity of the son. Efforts to say that Jews living today are morally culpable of what happened in the first century and the sins of their forefathers is just wrong. It's not biblical, period. And make no mistake about it. While Hitler is dead, the demonic spirit that possessed him is not. And it appears to be making a comeback. Hamas is just another manifestation of ir irrational, demonic Jew hate. Now, that said, and a lot of strong words, I've also seen a fair amount of comments where leaders describe Hamas as human animals. I'm not going to take the time to play a short video clip of that. You can, you can look for those. There, there's a lot of them out there. But our leaders, I'm seeing voices on social media describing Hamas as human animals. The true biblical Christian says that all humans are created in the image of God. The book of James chapter 3 says it this way. But no human can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and curses. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. Humans are not animals. Humans are created in the image of God. Such language is dehumanizing and degrading and disgusting. We can, we can stand up against evilness, wicked behavior, but we don't want to allow our speech to so dehumanize people that it makes them so other than us that we forget about our common humanity. Christians must think rightly 
about our cultural enemies. Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do that? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. For the Christian, we are called to love and serve our fellow humans, no matter who they are. We are called also to see our fellow humans as a mission field, someone to be prayed for, someone who needs to hear that Jesus, the Messiah, has come. This includes Jews, members of Hamas, Hezbollah, all of our cultural enemies, no matter where they may be. Ultimately, the only path to peace is that of preaching the gospel, to bring the kingdom of God near. It is through transformed hearts and the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. It will not come through the sword. It will not come through force or coercion. Real peace is by believing in Jesus as the Messiah, he is the Prince of Peace. The core of the problems that we are facing right now are rooted and grounded in worldview differences. Christians, Jews, and Muslims identify different problems and different solutions. So what are we to make of the state of Israel, the nation of Israel? Now here, again, I want to make it very clear. I'm not talking about individual Jews. I'm talking about a nation, a geopolitical governing body, okay? Israel is a liberal democratic state. It has democratic elections, the rule of law, and a desire to be at peace with its neighbors. That said, Israel is not perfect. It has pride parades and abortions, just like we have in our country. It has corrupt politicians and good ones, just like we do. No country in the world today is without problems or corruption. I'm not here to be an apologist for the state of Israel as being without error or blemish or injustice. But it is one thing to point out something that Israel has done wrong, as long as it's being pointed out according to God's law, just as we do in our own country, in a desire to hopefully make a course correction and make things right. But it is an entirely another different situation to demonize Israel to the point of saying it doesn't have a legitimate right to exist, which as far as I understand it seems to be the position of Hamas. Should we support the geopolitical nation of Israel? Personally, I support Israel. This is a personal opinion. As a nation, because I see them as a strategic democratic ally in the Middle East. Again, that's not to say that they are perfect or without injustices. But saying that I support Israel as a geopolitical state or an entity is not the same thing as saying I support the actions of all Jews as political allies or that I support every decision that the government of Israel makes. Now, we can have a healthy debate about how involved the U.S. should be in what's happening in Israel. We can respectfully disagree with each other about what's happening in the war without engaging in Jewish hate or co even completely villainizing the Palestinians. Two things can be true at the same time. We can believe that the Palestinian people may have some legitimate, non-trivial grievances against the state of Israel while also affirming that the attack of Hamas on October the 7th was a disgusting terrorist assault on civilians that deserves condemnation. Personally, I find the history and politics of Israel complicated. <laughs> there is no strictly good guys, bad guys here. And as far as I can see it, 
I'm still researching these issues. I'm trying desperately to differentiate between propaganda and reality, and I encourage you to do the same. But even if you favor one side of the conversation, applauding the deliberate murder of civilians should not be part of what we do as Christians. Rather, our primary call is to pray and to love and serve our enemies, whoever they are. And just as we don't want to conflate Jewish people with the nation of Israel, we also don't want to conflate Palestinians with Islam. To be Palestinian is an ethnicity. There are Palestinian Jews, Palestinian Christians, and Palestinian Muslims. Our brothers and sisters in Christ are located all over the Middle East. They need our prayers and possibly our physical support as well. The church in Iran is the fastest growing church in the world. Don't confuse the government in Iran that is backing Hamas as being an excuse to neglect our prayers for the gospel to continue to move forward even during times of war and distress, and our biblical obligation to try to help our brothers and sisters where we can, and to try to help ease the suffering that so many people in the Middle East are going through right now. All right, we're at the end of the hour. So one final thought I want to leave you with. If you are hearing that the events in Israel mean that Jesus is coming very soon, like next week, very, very soon, I want to encourage you to be a hopeful skeptic. If you hear radio preachers telling you that they know how the events of today fit into the final chapters of Ezekiel or the book of Revelation, something along those lines, be a hopeful skeptic. The informed Christian with a robust Christian worldview knows that we ought to live expectantly each and every day that Jesus will come back. But we should never presume that we know how the events are unfolding and everything that they mean. Exercise due caution with these kinds of predictions. I'm a skeptic that that's really how all of this works. Again, feel free to take my class on the book of Revelation for more information about these issues. Uh, you can see my teachings on YouTube about the end of the world that I did last year. I think it was a three or four part series that might be of some help to you. But I want to encourage you, if you're feeling a lot of anxiety, just know that we as a world have been through many hard things before. I don't know how hard it's going to get. But what we do know is that our faith is an anchor and that you can hold fast to Jesus. He will help to guide you. He will help to minister to your broken heart. My heart is heavy too. I'm struggling too. But turn your anxiety over to him. Give him gratitude for your blessings and ask him for grace to deal with the things that are difficult. I hope you found this teaching helpful and may God have mercy on us all. God bless. Mm -hmm.